Amen. That song is called The Commission, and that is what God has called us to do, to go and tell the world about him. Today, Lord, as we uh, gather together, we welcome everyone to this place, and we, we welcome Jesus and the Holy Spirit in, and let's all stand and honor and glorify our Lord in music.
something too big or too small that you can do that you cannot be forgiven and the Lord accepts you. you 
Amen, church. Amen. Amen. I had it confirmed from Brody Palsa for Margareta Schools and Sky for Edison Schools that we are officially on summer break. It was the first week of summer for Bellevue Schools. Our other schools have caught up. They finished their last weeks of school. And so I'm wondering this question before you're seated. Find someone to ask this. What are you most looking forward to this summer? Okay. Turn around, greet someone, ask them that question and see their response. And you may be seated. You may be seated. Just, just a word of reminder about Wiggly Worship. We do not have Wiggly Worship on Sundays for this service. Wiggly Worship has moved to Wednesdays. You can see a whole panel in the bulletin that, that dedicates the dates and the times with that in mind. We also don't have nursery for this service for the summertime. And so summertime schedules, schedules change there. 1030 service, we do have We Worship, which is our preschool age group, as well as nursery care. But for this service, we, we don't offer anything. Don't worry, we're going to be interactive today in different ways, even though my own kids, as I'm leaving the house this morning, says, is it going to be boring today in church? <laughs> Moving on. <clears throat> R -r Reminder for youth, that would be going into grade 6 through 12. Tonight is the, the beginning of summer bash. We've got a campfire. There will be different glow-in-the-dark games that will be played, basketball, cornhole, just all sorts of stuff sprawled out on the back church lawn. That's from 8.30 p.m. until 10 p.m. And so, yes, do not call the house this afternoon. I am napping in preparation for tonight, 8.30 to 10, but just a fun time had. That's for any child going into 6th grade through 12th grade, and you'll hear more about youth group and the plans ahead with the summer arrangements in mind but that, that's the kickoff game tonight another annual summer tradition that we have is with our child care our pre our, our daycare and preschool the rummage sale that's an annual fundraiser for our daycare is the dates june 15th and june 16th after the service next sunday if you're at the nine o'clock service we could also use some help assembling some of the tables and different things like that but you are welcome to drop any rummage that you would like to donate to the church that will be sold away on june 15th and 16th you can start dropping that off beginning today and, and spanning up through that d duration as well we've got an opportunity to, to sign up for a pastoral visit Last year, uh, as a part of our 10 years together, we did a, a dialogue worth the decades. And what I found out 10 years later is that there's a lot of meaningful conversations that you have that you don't always have time for on a Sunday morning capacity. And so it, it, those of you, if, if you've never had a dialogue with me, I would like to have a dialogue with you. Those of you that, that maybe have something that you'd just like to talk to me about or ask a question about or any of those things, there are sign-up sheets in the, the main hallway to my left on the other side of that brick wall with different times and dates in June. And so if that interests you, not mandatory by any means, but if that interests you there, you can sign up for one of those time slots or get in touch with me if one of those time slots does not work and we can schedule one in that way. But just something for the summer time a little chat together and reminder to today is the last day of round one of the church votes Ellen Kramer and Andrea Nystrom led us last week there about the process thereof. It's also printed in your bulletin yet again. You've got five names that we're going to whittle down to two names by the end of 12 noon today. And then after that, beginning midweek this week, you'll have an email and a link and some capabilities to vote online. Or, or you can once again wait till next Sunday and fill out another paper ballot as we limit two names down to one name. And so two rounds of voting for members only. This one is the last around one from five names down to two names. And those ballots will be in the back with, with members from the naming committee. If you have any questions or to get your ballot as well, you can see that after the service as well. 
Joyce Tucker is going to come forward and give us a little information about Operation Christmas Child. We hear a lot about Operation Christmas Child in the fall months as we're packing boxes, but this is a year-round mission, and Joyce is going to let us know a way that we can help prepare for, for the mission ahead. It's on. Yes, hopefully everybody has heard about shoeboxes by now, and if you haven't, I'll be more than happy to tell you all about it. Um, but it is an outreach to kids around the world, and it's not just giving them stuff, it's giving them... Um, Jesus. It's really, it's the point of evangelism. Um, So we, last year we we filled 1,075 boxes at our packing party and it takes $10 a box to ship and it's not just shipping dollars, it's it's the materials that goes with them, that that evangelism piece, um, that the where, the, where they end up, wherever town they're in, village, um, that they have materials to teach these kids about Jesus. So that $10 is more than just shipping. Um, so we have an opportunity to be a part of this walkathon. It's walk to ship, and it's walk two miles to ship our shoeboxes. Every dollar that we collect, if you're a part of this church and um, working as our team, uh, we're going to go over to Fremont. We'll be walking those two miles on the bike path. If you're not a walker, don't have time on the 25th to do it, we would love to have you sponsor somebody. And I think we're up to eight, maybe 10 walkers now. Dave broski has been in the back recruiting, so he'll, he'll find you. Um, and so um, I can make more of these envelopes. You know, we'd love to have a big team of us go over there together to represent. And, uh, and this is just a great way to make this mission work. So thanks. And Joyce, correct me if I'm wrong, is this the first year that they're doing this walkathon? Yes. Um, there, if if you don't understand the the hierarchy of of Operation Christmas Child, there's it's such a humongous organization and it's run by volunteers. There's um, regionals. There's you know. Anyways, we're a local Northwest Ohio team that covers six counties right now, and there's um, I'm one of the year-round volunteers. Uh, a different volunteer, her name is Angela. She's the one that set this up, and she goes to Grace Community Church herself. So that's, it's, you know, it's in her backyard. Um, but we're just getting to participate with it. She did the legwork of getting it organized, and so we're thankful for that. Yes. Opportunity to be uh, involved in the first annual Walk with that in mind. Oh, yeah. Did you hear that? Yeah, there's some extra. We want to be praying for the ministry while we're doing this, so there's going to be some prayer stations as we're walking. And it's just hopefully the weather will be nice, and we'll just, you know, it's a nice little way to get some exercise and, and you know, bring your kids, your grandkids along, and just have some fun together. Judy throws out the hot dogs, huh? <laughs> Go with the headliner, Judy, huh? <laughs> opportunity to plug into a meaningful mission and Joyce has done a lot of the Facebook posts with Operation and Christmas Child updating us as people have been receiving the shoe boxes worldwide and their comments of gratitude expressed to those that have taken part and so meaningful mission very much so in that way we're going to continue a time of uh, of worship and we're going to be talking about light a little bit later on through that boring sermon time, kiddos. That boring sermon time is going to be about light. And so we've got some songs with light in mind. we got the Wigglies in our midst. We won't do this every week, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm relying on you Wigglies for this one, okay? Because these next two songs, there's going to be a little motions. And your parents, they're, they're not the best at motions, okay? And so teach us a little bit about motions, if you would. It's this little light of mine. You maybe had sang as a little kid. You just need a finger, okay? We're starting small, adults. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, okay? Can, can you handle that? This is a little light of mine, I, I'm going to let it shine. There, there's going to be some other ones as we get into some other verses there. Just follow the lead up front. Everywhere I go, like act like you're walking, huh? I'm going to let it shine. Just work with me here, okay? The Wigglies are scattered around. They're going to help you. It's going to be all right. You Ready? Stand as you're able, let's sing to him. This is the light of mine.
this next one, I'm going to need some help because I don't know them. But I know every single time that we sing this song in church, I see some of you that do do some motions to this song. And so I say, it's fitting. One of those is Mike Beck. So come on forward, Mike. He did not know when he was waking up to church this morning that he was going to have to do this. He knew it about five minutes before the service that he was going to have to do this. And yet Mike's a good sport about it. He's stretching out. Follow Mike's lead for this one. Familiar song, but not familiar dance moves. He really is stretching out for this one. Dottie, you cue the music, and we're following Mike's lead on this one. Pray with me, church, before we're seated. Lord, we thank you for a chance to sing and to move together. We're reminded of your word in worship that worship means to bow down. Worship is a movement, Lord, not just a movement of our mouths. And so, Lord, we're praying that our worship here on Sundays truly would move us, not just with song motions, but would move us closer to you, move us closer to making a meaningful impact in this world that you've created us in. And so, Lord, move us in those directions we ask each and every Sunday we gather as your people. We're asking that in Jesus' name. And his people said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. And as you're being seated, it is time to start our summer sermon series. You ready for this? Start spreading the news beginning today. A new sermon series, Broadway, Broadway, so make it here, all summer year, you'll want to be a part of it, Bible, Broadway. It was way better a year ago in person, okay? TV loses something. We're not going there this year, okay? So don't worry. Last year, though, if you remember, we did the Bible and Broadway series where we covered different Broadway musicals and how they touch on some biblical truth. And we studied that all summer long last year. This year, we're going to stay with the arts, but not Broadway arts. We're going to actually look at literal artwork. We're going to look at picture art and how picture art leads us to to the biblical passages. Maybe you've heard the cliche, a picture's worth a thousand words. We're going to count on pictures leading us into the word of God. And this is not something new in Christian circles either. Some things maybe you don't know about your pastors 11 years into this is one of those things is, I like watching Rick Steves Europe on Saturday nights. (laughs) It's more interactive in the summertime, if you can't tell, okay? And that's my own pew alley right over there. 
Rick Steves Europe is on usually Saturday evenings, and particularly in the wintertime when we're closed in, dinner time in front of the TV is a Saturday thing only in our household. And so we do that on Saturdays, and conveniently, Rick Steves Europe is on. I I caught an episode a couple weeks back, and Rick Steves was traveling to different cathedrals and churches in Europe. And he was reminding his audience then that much of the artwork that's laced in church buildings is to teach the church story, to teach the gospel message. In medieval times, when many of those megalithic structures were made, people weren't as literate. It's not that they were dumb, it's just they weren't taught to read or write. And so the way to learn the stories is through stained glass windows or through statues, or through artwork that that littered the landscape of church buildings to teach the story, to teach this story, so that people could could live into the faith that that God has outlined to them. And so we're going to do much the same thing in different popular artworks that tie into us. And so a number of months back, I consulted our two most resident art workers, Elizabeth Denning works for Seneca East Schools in the art department, and Leslie Wooder is the art teacher at Bellevue High School. And I asked them, I said, what are the most popular works of art that just anyone has probably seen at least at some point in their life? And they each sent me this long list of of well-known pieces of art. And we took from that list and, and, and started to apply it to what does this piece of art maybe teach us about the biblical message together. And that's what popped out this sermon series, A Picture Worth a Thousand Words. So each week, we're going to look at a different one of those. This week, we're going to start with Starry Night. Before we get into this sermon series, we're going to relocate pews for a moment for those that are able to. When you are coming in the church... I might add, this is not going to be an every Sunday thing for this. I know we did it every Sunday in the Christmas time. This won't be every Sunday, but it fits for this Sunday with this piece of art. You were handed a popsicle stick, correct? When you entered the building today, that popsicle stick should have a number on it. I was asked by Cheryl before this, is this S? I said, no, that's a number five. Sorry for my penmanship, okay? So if there are those questions, just just take a guess at what number it is. But it's a number either one through eight. Based on your popsicle, if you can relocate to the church, ones are going to be here under Team Leonardo. Twos will be Team Michelangelo. Threes, Team Raphael. Fours, Team Picasso. Five, Teams Pollock. Six, Teams Rembrandt. Seven, Teams Dolly. And eight, Teams Bob Ross. Find the popsicle stick with your number. <laughs> if, if once you find your group, if once you find your group, the hardest part about doing this whenever we relocated in December was, was making pews into circles. It's kind of difficult to do. And so as best as you can, if you can be uh, gathered as a group so that you can hear one another, it gets a little loud when we're discussing things, and my apologies about that, but, but just try to get in your group as best as possible. If you haven't sensed already, artwork is the theme all around. Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, we're not talking Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles here. We're, we're talking artists and artwork and all those different things. And so art will be our theme all summer. This is the first piece of art that we're going to get into. And it's made by Vincent Van Gogh in the year 1889. A little bit more of that story we may get into a little bit later on. But this is maybe one of his most famous works of art known as Starry Night that is in an exhibit in New York City. And so we're going to talk Starry Night just for a moment as a lead-in to the Bible passage. As your group, I want you to think like artists for a moment and just talk as a group. What do you notice or what sticks out to you most as you're gazing at this piece of art? Just talk about it for two minutes in your group. Anything you notice about Vincent Van Gogh's Starry Night or maybe anything that you've heard about it if if this is not new to you in that way. So talk about it in your group for two minutes and then we'll come back together as a big church. So let's get back together as a big group. Vincent Van Gogh's Starry Night, a little chatter in the small groups about it. What do we notice about it? Any group? Observations? Artists in the back? We've got some in the back here, huh? You're pointing to Christine? Carol? (laughs) Jacob? I don't know that I want to hear from my own household, Caroline. huh? Jacob, what you got for this? Cool details for the wind. You'll notice the swirls. 
Van Gogh actually painted this with very thick, deep paint, too. If you ever look online at this painting, you can see the specific strokes of the pen and how thick he poured on the paint, which was not kind of the norm in, in, in his era for these paintings. But yes, it really highlights the swirls there in that. Is there other? Mitchell, what do you got for us? Yeah, Mitchell says a lack of hard lines. It's more curvature in the swirls there that is portrayed in that. All the answers are in this back corner, so I don't know why everyone else went to church today, but it's all hands are raised back there. We'll go one more back here, and then we'll get this corner there. Christine, you had one? Yes, Christine talks about the light and, and the light being supreme. And, and this is the first time she's noticed in reflecting on this that there's a village down below. Many think that Vincent van Gogh pictured or, or, or drew this picture based off a view he had while he was in an asylum, actually for some mental health issues. And so this is kind of his lookout from the asylum to the night sky outside. And so he's drawn the, the vividness of the, the light there in the midst of a night sky. And this village was not a part of that view. This village, many think, was him just drawing from recollection where he grew up. And so he kind of morphs together the night sky from the scene he sees in the asylum and this village of growing up uh, of which the, the church is prominent in that way. What, what many believe, not, not told one way or the other. We had some hands in this direction. Mary Lee? Well, largely. You know, it's very diffuse um, church. And that's just for the people who are in the church. A wreath on the church? Above the door? This group's sitting in the back of the church, and they notice a wreath that's sitting on the church. So we'll let Mary Lee have that one, okay? We'll just. <laughs> the scro and the scrolls represent. Wow. This Pollock crew, they're either out there or they're on to something. EJ, you got something? We're losing the crowd, man. Help us, okay? And like a blitz, the swirls happening all around of the night sky, noticing the swirls. Brody, you got one more for us? What you got, Brody? You know the what? The, the issues? Anger. Anger issues. Anger. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't quite going all these different directions there, church, but, but from my perspective, what, what I was noticing was some of the things alluded to there, and it's called Starry Night. And so it's night sky, darkness really does permeate this work of art. You'll notice the dark blues that Van Gogh uses through all this. And yet starry, he's highlighting the light, which Christine was getting at. Through the night sky, there's something different going on at this light. And you'll notice, like EJ was pointing out, those scary swirls. Whether there's snow accumulation or not behind it, it's some scary swirls. But every chance you get the light, the swirls permeate from the light. Like it beats back the scary swirls as the light keeps penetrating the darkness. You catching this? You hearing a picture through a thousand words, maybe on something that's in the words of Scripture? And then, of course, what, what draws my heart to this scene is the church at the center of it. Whether there's a wreath on it or not, I'll let you debate with Mary Lee. But there is a church for sure in the center of that scene. And, of course, church has been our word of the year through this. But church just as a focal point, church as that highest point in the community with that steeple that's connecting all this wonder and swirl and the light radiating in the heavens with what's going on on earth and even the individual lights in the homes there. The church is to be a connecting point between earthly realities and heavenly swirls in all of this that I think is portrayed in some way through this deep work of art, Starry Night. 
I, I shared with you a moment ago, peeled back the curtain a little bit, Rick Steves, Europe fan of, and all of that. You didn't know that about me, probably, in 12 years of knowing me. You probably didn't know this about me either. But this is not Vincent Van Gogh. This is Vincent Van Jump. But th this is what, what I had gifted my mother with this past Christmas. And this is, don't be impressed, it's one of those paint-by-number kind of a things. <laughs> but... <clears throat> But the, the side of me that you did know is that one of my hobbies, I like to watch sports. And yet sports can take a lot of time there that is really, what's the point of it? it it's meaningless, trivial times. And so I feel kind of the guilt sometimes of sitting down to watch a sports game. And, and so I, I pair up that trivial pursuit of watching sports with sometimes of doing something that, that might be more productive at times. So the game's on in the background as on Sunday night football, I'm whittling away at an art project or something like this to, to what I feel redeem the time a little bit more. And like I said, I, I think, I hope, mom's here, you can ask her. I, I, I thought this was a really good Christmas gift there be, because this is a painting that, that's near and dear to my mother. I remember growing up as a child in the classroom. She's a school teacher. She had this artwork up in her classroom and taught a, a unit on this artwork as a part of that. And so it's just one of those images that's ingrained into the mind as a young kid growing up and seeing that in mama's classroom. And so that's part of the meaning behind that. And so that's why I would start an art series with this specific artwork in mind of Starry Night. Always the picture needs to lead us into the Word of God, where our truth comes from. And so I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, as I think this picture helps us understand something that Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. So as a group, Bibles are where you're located. Open up to Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to talk about this passage a little bit later on in a moment. But Matthew 5 will be our text. If you can find verse number 14 of Matthew chapter 5. Shout out the page number so that we can all get there. Thank you. A lot on that same page. 1378, Matthew 5, verse 14. It's the words of Jesus. It's from the Sermon on the Mount, which ranges from Matthew 5 through Matthew 7. So this is early on to his sermon when he says this statement in Matthew 5:14. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we're praying that through the sermon that you're the one actually preaching. This is your sermon on the mount. It's your words to us still to this day. And we're just praying that you would point out through your word, Lord, how we can shine and how that shining would bring you glory in this world of swirling that, that, that we sometimes feel a part of. And so lead us in that direction we're asking. In Jesus' name, amen. As I mentioned a moment ago, just context-wise of this passage, it, it is a part of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 through Matthew 7, Jesus is preaching the most famous sermon ever preached. And the Sermon on the Mount begins in this way, Matthew 5, verse 1 and 2. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down, and his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. So who's Jesus teaching? But his, his followers, his disciples, which is a larger crowd than just the 12. Those of you that were watching The Chosen, The Chosen Season 2 in small groups where we ended small groups, The Chosen Season 2 ended with Jesus preaching, correct? The Sermon on the Mount. There, there was all this lead up into the Sermon on the Mount and that portrayed that scene that Matthew 5 through Matthew 7 is portraying. And so this is teaching to Jesus' people. Jesus' followers, Jesus' disciples, it's us by extension that Jesus is saying, you are the light of the world. He, he starts his Sermon on the Mount with a saying of Beatitudes. Beatitudes simply means the blessed life. And Jesus is totally redefining what the blessed life is. It, it's not the, the, the white picket fence and the new flashy cars and all of that that might be sold in the blessed life of the American dream. Jesus totally turns upside down what the blessed life is. 
He says the blessed life is hungering and thirsting for righteousness, like always wanting more of him. And what is this things of God to really sink our teeth in? He, he says the blessed life is those who are peacemakers. He says the blessed life is those who show mercy and compassion. Like Jesus totally flips head over heels what the true blessed life is in the sight of God. You're going to get a different version sold to you of what the blessed life is. Jesus is selling us what God's blessed life looks like in the Beatitudes. That's how he begins his Sermon on the Mount. And then from the Beatitudes, he gives two different you are statements to his people. The first of those is, you are the salt of the earth. It's in verse number 13. And the second of those you are statements is, you are the light of the world, that paragraph that we just mentioned. I'm going to show for you a little scene from The Chosen where Jesus is explaining to Matthew, his disciple and The Chosen, as they're working through the sermon, he gives a little nuance about why he calls his followers the salt of the, salt of the earth that I think is just telling for what we want to do next for the statement Jesus saying, you are the light of the world. So this is from The Chosen, season two, Jesus' conversation with his disciple Matthew in it. What does you are the salt of the earth even mean? I'm not good at metaphor. Salt preserves meat from corruption. It slows its decay. I want my followers to be a people who hold back the evil of the world. Salt also enhances the flavor of things. I want my followers to renew the world and be part of its redemption. Salt can also be mixed with honey and rubbed on the skin for maladies. I want my people to participate in the healing of the world. Not its destruction. Then why not just say that? <laughs> Come on, Matthew. Allow me a little poetry, huh? Not everyone is like you. Some people like a little flavor. Read the songs of David or, or Solomon. I'm not going nearly as far with metaphor as Solomon. I'm reading him next. Well, good luck. He's probably... If you've watched The Chosen, you know Matthew, highly type A. He wants it spelled out, doesn't like metaphor, doesn't like illustration. Just give it to him in a list and he can handle that. But Jesus is using here poetry, metaphor, and illustration when he calls his people, you are the salt of the earth. He doesn't literally mean like you're salt, like you're just this hunk of something that we can sprinkle on steak. Or, no, he, he's using metaphor to communicate what kind of people he wants his people to be. And he spells that out in that conversation, right? Salt's a preservative in the ancient world. You rub salt on meat to preserve it for the long haul. And so God's people is to be preservatives of this world. That there are some ways and some things that, that we're called to preserve the environment that we're in. And not, not just from an ecological standpoint, but the world rushing on to darkness. We hold back the evil, as Jesus inaugurates. We bring flavor to life. Jesus' people should be the most joy-filled. Hungry, compassionate, righteous, just loving life the most should be those people that understand that God is the creator of life and he's given them life, right? We should be bringing out the flavor of life as Jesus' people. And he's communicating that by just saying you're the salt of the earth. And, and salt also used as a healing malady in, in the ancient world. And so we're to bring healing to this world that we live in as well. He, he says all those things by just saying this one thing, right? You're the salt of the earth. He's doing the same thing with light. When he calls us, you are the light of the world. And so I want you in your group to start digging deeper. What could Jesus possibly mean when he says to us, you're the light of the world? What's Jesus getting at? Why does he use that specific illustration? He could have used any illustration. He could have used any metaphor. He starts with two, your salt and your light. Why does he do light? Talk about that for, for two minutes in your group. Why do you think Jesus taught his followers that you are the light of the world? Talk about that for two minutes. Let's bring it back to the big group here. Back groups, you, you hammered the picture question there. Let's, let's go to the front half of the church with this light question. Let's see if we had any light bulb moments. Emily's got one for us. Emily says, light as hope, and, and light bringing hope into it. So Jesus' people are to bring hope into this world. And pairing that up even with Starry Night, right? There's dark swirls. It's scary setting. And yet what, what turns back the scariness, what radiates in the other directions is this light, this beacon of hope for, for a person that was struggling with depression, 
Van Gogh, as he's making Starry Night in an asylum, he, he's seeing these images of hope that help him. So yeah, certainly, light connection with hope. Others, why does Jesus call us the light of the world? David, what you got? Right on. David talks about us supposed to be the light of the world, and part of that being to go out and tell other people about Jesus. And he's spot on with that. We've got a message tied in with this hope, tied into what Jesus has done for us, that exemplified through the light. Good, good. Others there. What about light? Anything from Team Michelangelo? I mean, like you painted the whole Sistine Chapel. This is your thing, huh? What about light? Anything come out of this group? <laughs> first order of business next time we do popsicle sticks find the most extroverted in your group and appoint them to be the group spokesperson okay so we'll, we'll know that we're getting into summer routines and those things but if popsicle sticks come back out anything from team leonardo what about light i saw tammy use her hands in gesturing something there and we weren't even Light draws people, Tammy's getting at, and she's right. We, we go outside in summertime because the light's on longer in the summertime. We were pumping gas late at night after church league softball, and my kids were observing the, the bugs flying off the lights at Bassett's there, and they said, Dad, are those the lights that are going to zap people? That's a whole totally different direction you could go with, with some of this light there. But we, there's something about us that's attracted to light. And even bugs find that same attraction to light in some different ways. Well, let me suggest some different things that I think are encompassed with this light. And, and particularly, we got one more back there. Is it Jacob's hand? You said church is going to be boring, man. And look at you, huh? What you got? We're going to let Jacob preach next week, okay? We're going to let Jacob preach next week. I, Mary Lee, really? Really? <laughs> Go with the group Pollock there. Light shines, radiates, shows the way. Jamie, were you getting to that same line of thinking there? Light defeats darkness. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's quoting the Gospel of John there that we're going to get into. Exactly spot on. L let me just suggest some things about light that I think are significant. And one of those is the way Scripture begins. Remember the first words that God speaks in the Bible? It says, let there be light. And so light is going to be a key theme throughout all of Scripture. And if you're reading particularly the Gospel of John, which Jamie was getting at with her comment about light overcoming darkness. Light is that key theme that John keeps pointing to as this emblem of hope, this impersonation of who Jesus is and what he came to do to drive away the darkness itself. And so all this, I think, ties in in some ways to Jesus' statement and his use of, you are the light of the world. Let me just drop three things quickly that I think are tied together with this picture in mind and with Jesus' words on, on, on being the light of the world. And the first of those is, is the reality that the world can be a dark place. That's part of Starry Night, right? The dark swirls. It, the, the world can be a dark, swirling, scary place at times. And, and Jesus saying you are the light hints at that if you're the light, then darkness exists too, right? That there's a dark reality that we're called to shine into. If he's calling his people the light of the world, that, that is also inferring between the lines that darkness is a real thing. And, and that is in the Bible itself. Opening pages, in many ways, is God putting order to darkness. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep when God starts to order the darkness by saying in the very next verse, let there be light. Reading into the New Testament there, John 3 would say this, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. There is something about darkness and evil when in the day that, that, that crime most often 
Not always, but most often is done under the cover of darkness. Well, what is that connection? John's pointing to that connection in John 3. And remember, this is just a few breaths after maybe that most iconic verse in the Bible. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's two, three verses after that that he's reminding us lights come into the world through the Son that God has given, gifted the world. He, he wants to shine in lives, knowing the, the dark reality. Yet again in the New Testament, for you were once in darkness. This is Paul writing to a church, I might add, okay? For you, so he's speaking to you all. Preacher up front, too. You once were in darkness, but now you're the light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, in righteousness, in truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that's illumined becomes a light. That is why it's said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You're not expected to have the light in and of yourself. You're expected to be shined on, and that transmit the light to you. Remember when Jesus says, you're the light of the world, they didn't have light switches then, right? Like, we're aware of this. To, to understand what Jesus is saying, we have to go back to the times that Jesus said it to understand it. And, and lights back then, you had a light one of two ways. It was the natural light, the God-given light, the sunlight, the moonlight, the starlight that God created way back at the beginning. You, you had light in that way, the natural way, or you had light by a fire that you lit lamps from one fire touching another fire, touching another fire, touching another fire. And that's the illustration when Jesus is speaking to his people, you are the light of the world, it comes with that understanding of light in mind, right? Like this light comes from above, and the way that, that my life is sparked is by someone else sparking it. And, and that God sent light into this world reminds us that God provided the candle. It's Jesus. Let Jesus shine into you, and that sets you ablaze in these ways of righteousness and truth and goodness. You, you catching all this? deep stuff that Jesus is getting at. Deep for a kindergartner, even deeper for a 90-year-old. You know, this is what Jesus means when he says, you are the light of the world. And yet again, in Matthew 4, this is the chapter before our passage, he quotes the Old Testament when he says, people living in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in a land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The reason for Jesus' coming was to bring the light. And so if point number one is that darkness is real, those swirls is the reality that we wake into. And kids, by the way, that's why your parents don't want you to learn your lessons through TikTok or whatever YouTube is doing or whatever your friends are doing. It's this reality that, that, that life is dark. And, and TikTok doesn't have the answers. And, and YouTube isn't always going to point us in the right direction. Th those aren't light-giving institutions. This is filled with the dark environment that, that we're a part of. And, and, and parents, that doesn't change when we go into adulthood, right? That, that means sometimes why we can't go in the path that all of our coworkers are going on. Or, or why we can't just do what everyone else is doing. Because the reality is, is, is it can be a dark world at times. The swirls are real. And they're not swirling in the places that we want to go in. But, but the sermon would be a depressor if it ended there. There is a but. It, it's that Jesus is the light of the world. And that swirl in starry night gets changed by that radiating light. Remember that picture? All those swirls are swirling in a direction. It's chaotic, but every beacon of light that you see, the wave goes in a different direction, and it swallows up the darkness. It's beautiful. That's why it's known as starry night, not just night. Christians, you, you realize that there is the star, and it's not you. It's, it's Jesus. And actually, that's an image, the bright morning star that's of, used of Jesus in Scripture. Interesting stuff, all these things, isn't it? There's a starry night that wants to shine in all of our lives that Matthew and the other gospel writers are pointing us to Jesus himself. It's this point. There is a light. 
and his name is Jesus. The Bible says it this way. Jesus spoke again to the people, and he said, I am the light of the world. Who's the light? Jesus is the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Light symbolizes life-giving nature. We need light for life, right? Your garden ain't going to grow if it ain't getting sunlight. Try it. Just put it under a bowl and then pick it back up in October and tell me the lush tomatoes that you get. Ain't happening, right? You need light to to be fruit-bearing in those ways. You need Jesus in your life to bear fruit that lasts, fruit that bears into eternity. Yet again, the Bible and Jesus being the light. People living in darkness, seeing a great light. Those living in the land of the shadow of death, his light has dawned, and from that time on, Jesus began preaching. Correlation between Old Testament and fulfillment found in Jesus hitting the scene in Matthew chapter 4. Yet again, John 5, this is the reference we were going at with Jamie. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's John's gospel way of pointing to Jesus, who he declares just a couple chapters later is the light of the world. So there is a light. His name is Jesus. Point number three in all of this, that that was to illustrate there. The swirls all around, and yet how it changes when it intersects the light. How those swirls radiate outwards rather than swirling up and down and around like the darkness there is. Point number three, as Jesus' followers, you were made to shine. And following is shining. That's following Jesus is what it looks like to shine in this world. Isn't that good news, church? You were made to shine. You weren't made to be a dark, chaotic circle. You were made to radiate the one who made you, created you, and has a plan and purpose for you. You were made to shine, and shining is when you're following Jesus. It's how we learn how to shine in this world. It interests me. In this passage we read a moment ago, I know that's small print. We just were in it. You can look down at your Bible, same thing. It says, you're the light of the world. Right after making that statement, it goes into these different statements about the places and spaces that us in to shine. So he says, you're the light of the world. And then another illustration, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. So image in mind, a city that's built on a hilltop, everyone's looking up to. And that's what Jesus is getting at with you being the light. He's putting you in high places to to be an example in some way, like a city on a hill. He's going to further tease that out in verse 15. Neither do people put a light and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. So once again, think people in Jesus' day, no light switch to turn on with a light above the room. They got a candle light. When you bring that candle to the room, you're not instantly putting it underneath a bowl right? You want that to shine and give light into the other room. Like the places God puts you in, he wants you to shine for him. Don't give me this, I was going to use a sharp word there, but my wife is in attendance and so I won't go that route. Don't give me this mumbo jumbo. We'll go that route, okay? Don't give me this mumbo jumbo about I've got Christian faith, but it's private. Ain't no such thing. God's given you a light, not so that you put it under a bowl and just keep it to yourself. Let that light radiate, people. Share that faith. Not always is sharing that faith preaching to someone, okay? He's given me that task, but he might not have given you that task. But it is always looking for ways, whether through your words or through your ways to glorify him. You catching this, Christian? You don't have private faith if you have Christian faith. It's to be public. It's to permeate every ounce of who you are. It affects the way you raise your kids. It affects the way you do your job. It affects every fabric of your life. You were made to shine. And you're not shining if you're trying to keep that under a bowl. Catching that, Christian? You're sitting on a hill. You're a light that's shining to radiate into this dark world and bring glory to him. Not to yourself. It might hurt self. It might cause self to lose some friends. It might cause self to lose some jobs. It might cause self some self-harm. But you're following the one that bore the cross for you. And so you can bear some things for him too, right? You're the light of the world. Follow him. That doesn't mean it's ever going to be every day rosy, but it does mean it makes every day significant in the eternal scope of things. 
sitting on a hill, neither two people light a lamp, put it under a bowl. Instead, it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify who? Glorify your Father in heaven. Amen, church. The question I'm going to leave you with, not to discuss in your group, but to ponder and to live out, is what is one good deed? Not asking for a big deed, not asking for a costly deed. I'm asking for one good deed, because that's what the Bible says. Good deeds glorify the Father in heaven. What is one good deed that you can do this week that will bring glory to God? Let's reflect on that and live in that as we leave this place this week. Amen? Before we leave, we want to ponder anew at the Lord's table, and so prepare your heart for communion. I want you to take the back of your bulletin. I realize you're probably in a different seat, and maybe some of you don't have a bulletin. It's a perfect opportunity to go from memory. We're going to do our liturgy of, of God made us a family if our bulletin isn't at hand. Allow this to remind us why we gather at the Lord's table as a family regularly. Family's got to eat. And provided the food and this meaningful meal that points us closer to Jesus. And so church, as we lead into communion, I will remind you, God made us a family. 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 These are our hopes and ideals. Help us to attain them, O God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? One key thing that parental books will often discuss about is family time around a table. Just what takes place in menial times around a table bonds families together. It's no wonder that Jesus has given his family, his people, a table, the Lord's table, to remember him by. And there's a special bond that takes place together and ultimately to him as we remember him around the table. Church, I will just remind you the significance of this table. Jesus ate with his followers, his disciples, nearly 2,000 years ago, the night leading to the cross. And he took bread, ordinary bread that he broke in their midst. And he said, this bread, it's my body that's broken for you. Same table, there was a drink. It was a cup. Jesus called it the cup of the new covenant, the cup of his blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then he invited us. He said, drink of it. And as often as you do, to do it in remembrance of him. Pray with me, church. So, Lord, in remembrance of you, desiring to encounter you, wanting to hunger and thirst for this righteousness like you talked about in your Sermon on the Mount, Lord, we come to your table. We pray that you meet us in this moment and that you impact us as only you can do, Lord, leading us beyond this table into the places and places you've planted us. So lead us in that way, we pray, in Jesus' name. And his people said, Amen. If those serving in communion would come forward at this time, as they do so, I want to remind you, the way we're taking part in communion, the servants will tear off a piece of bread and they will hand it to you. And so as you're coming forward with communion, if you would just simply have your hands out ready to receive what God has ultimately given, have your hands out, they will tear off bread, they will hand it to you, then you can take that bread and dip it in the cup and consume it. If you have a gluten allergen, please see me for gluten-free allergies. The, the servers are hand sanitizing as we speak in all this. I want to remind you what Doug Winter reminded you last month when we took communion, and that is that that, that communion is an open table. It's, it's the Lord's table. And so if any way you want to respond to the Lord, this table is for you. It's his table after all. And so this is open for you to come to receive him and to be changed by him, as is always the invite for us. And as you come forward, Dottie, we're going to skip the closing hymn, but if you can play for us, shine, Jesus, shine, as people are receiving communion as a part of this. Once you take communion, you can be at leave to dismiss but always leave this place following Jesus. Amen?
The table is set. Please come. <laughs>